And so the big question that echoes through all of his human history is this, God, how do you want us to worship you? How do you want us to worship you? So God gives an answer, right? In the, in the Old Testament, he gives an answer. He says, okay, here's what I want. At book of Exodus, take a year old lamb, unblemished. Take, a, take you know, this is so, so crazy. Take a year old lamb, unblemished. And, and the Lord God says through Moses, says, take it into your homes. I don't know if you noticed this. You guys, you guys know the story, right? You guys? You're smart. So, um, take this lamb into your homes. And you have to live with this lamb for an entire week. I don't know if you knew this, caught this in the story. You have to, this lamb is living in your house for an entire week. What happens when it's living in your house for an entire week? A couple things. One is protected, because it has to be unblemished, right? So it's protected. Number two, it's the reason why your mom and dad, when you brought home a stray pet, didn't let you keep it. Because you keep it, and what happens? All of a sudden, you start to love it. This lamb, this animal, becomes precious to you. Like, this now is your animal. This is now your pet. This is now something that you love. So, A, it's protected. B, it becomes valuable to you. It is precious. And over the course of that week, what was just this anonymous lamb? And now all of a sudden, it's connected to your heart. So what happens is you go with your dad on that Friday. You go with your dad and you'd walk through the streets of Jerusalem. You'd be carrying the lamb around your shoulders. Because it has to be unblemished still. It has to be protected still. And you love this lamb now. And you carry this lamb to the, the, the wall that surrounded the temple. And there's a, there was, at the time, there was, a, there was like a chest-high wall around the temple. On the other side of the, of the wall, there were the, the priests, the Levitical priests. And what happened is, you would, with your father, you'd hold the lamb over the, this wall with its head on that side. And you'd hold this lamb that you loved, it's precious to you now. You'd hold it down as one of the Levitical priests took the lamb's head and cut its throat and let the, the life of the animal be poured into this bowl, be collected. Now, this is the moment you're presenting your sacrifice. This is the moment that you're... Now, gosh, you guys, this is the moment that the thing, that at that moment mattered more to you than anything else. You're presenting it at that chest-high wall saying, this is my sacrifice. But here's the thing. At that moment, the sacrifice wasn't completed. At that moment, the sacrifice wasn't offered to the Father yet. It was just presented at that chest-high wall. So that priest would take the bowl of the lamb's life, right, its blood, pass it to the next priest, to the next priest, to the next priest, and would all go all the way up into the temple, into the altar. And the last priest would take the bowl of blood of that lamb and would pour it out onto the altar. And that was the moment that the lamb was offered to the Father. That was the moment the lamb was offered to God. So again, at the chest high wall, that's the presentation. This is my sacrifice. But then when it's poured out, it's like, no, now, Father, this is for your glory. Pouring this out for you. We're offering this. This is the point of worship. This is the point of the sacrifice. And why am I going through all this? Gosh. Because I want to know how God wants to be worshipped. Because if he matters at all, then he has to matter completely. So how has he asked us to worship him? The Old Testament was take this lamb, present it, slaughter it, offer it. In the new covenant, how does God explicitly ask to be worshiped? Sorry, explicitly tell us to worship him. At the Last Supper, Jesus, with his disciples, says this. He lifts up bread and says, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body given for you. Taking a chalice filled with wine, take of this, take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which we poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The God of the universe is saying, how do I want to be worshipped? Do this in memory of me. If you want to know what true worship is, do this in memory of me. Not ersatz worship. 
to worship that Jesus promised. Worship in spirit and in truth. Now, here's the moment. This is the moment where a lot of people will be like, okay, I'm tracking with you, but like, uh, like any church has that. Like any church has, like they have communion and stuff like this, but here's the reality. Especially, I don't know if you've ever heard anyone who said something like, well, um, uh, well, I, mean, I know that, like, the Eucharist, like, Holy Communion, that's like, a, that's like a symbol of Jesus, right? That's like a, have you ever heard anyone say that, that Eucharist is a symbol of Jesus? Not really Jesus, just a symbol of Jesus. And I think, like, that's great, because maybe in the Gospels, when Jesus said, do this in memory of me, maybe it could, you could read that. I mean, he did say, this is my body, this is my blood, not this looks like. Um, <laughs> where did Jesus make it absolutely clear that this actually is him? If you go to John's Gospel, we're going to rip through this as quickly as I can. Go to John's Gospel, you go to chapter 6. Now this is kind of an interesting thing. Beginning of John's Gospel, chapter 6, there are these people that are, there are like 5,000 people. It actually says 5,000 men, not including the women and the children in the counting. So who knows, if every guy brought along a wife and a kid, 15,000. Up to 15 to 20,000 people could have been there. John says five, we'll stick with five. So 5,000 people, they're hungry. So Jesus says, we need to feed them. We don't have anything except for five loaves and two fish. So Jesus, give it to me gives thanks, breaks. He feeds 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. You heard that story. That night, Jesus sends his apostles, his disciples across the Sea of Galilee, and that night he walks on water. So I think about this. Feed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish, walk across water. Big day for Jesus. The next morning, (laughs) the next morning, it says the people who he had fed the day before realize he's not there anymore, so they go looking for him. And John even makes a point of saying why they're looking for him. He says they're not looking for him because they believe in him now. They're looking for him because they want more food. They're hungry again. And so Jesus sees them coming, and he knows it too. And Jesus is like, hey, I know why you're here. He goes, you you want more food, don't you? And they're kind of like, well, (laughs) if you're offering. Because that just makes sense, right? You track down Jesus, he's like McDonald's on sandals. I mean, just like... (laughs) You hand him some root beer and some Doritos, and it's like a buffet. <laughs> Eggs Benedict's for everyone. <laughs> Sounds good. Anyways, Jesus says, well, I'll give you some food that if you eat it, you'll never be hungry again. And they say, yes, please. He says, well, I'm the bread. I am the bread that comes down from heaven. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. At this point, no, here's a quick little clarification. There are three groups of people that Jesus is talking to. There's three groups of people. There is the, the crowd. Those are the people who just, like, they came out that day because there was nothing on Netflix. So, like, well, let's go to Jesus. You know, he does a miracle. He feeds us, like, dinner and a show. Basically, that's it. <laughs> then there's, there's the disciples. There are people, these are people who left their family, their friends. They left everything to follow Jesus. And then the third group of people are, are, are the apostles, right? So this is the first group, the, the Jews, the crowd. It says then, and this is John chapter 6, verse 41, it says, the Jews murmured about him because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. And they're like, wait a second, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? We know this guy, and we're not going to believe him. So Jesus amps it up, and he says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And here's this kicker, here's like the line. He says, and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. Now, at this moment, you can pause and say, okay, well, maybe Jesus is speaking metaphorically. Maybe he's speaking, like, allegorically. Maybe he's speaking literally. How can you tell? Well, you can tell by reading the next line. Because it then says, the Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Pause. Does it sound like they're thinking that he's using figurative language or literal language? Literal, exactly. They're like, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? That's not like, how can he metaphorically give us his flesh to eat? They're asking the question... (laughs) So this is a great opportunity for Jesus at that moment to say, oh, whoa, 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 no, 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 I don't mean like that. I don't mean like, ah, ah, ah. like I, <laughs> let me clarify. This is Jesus' perfect opportunity to back up and say, oh, no, no, no. I mean like, you know, figuratively. But Jesus instead, he doesn't just back down, he ramps it up. He doesn't just ramp it up once or twice or three. He ramps it up five times. In response to the Jews murmuring about him, saying, how can he give us his flesh to eat? Jesus says this, number one, amen, amen, I say to you. Now, quick, in your Bibles it might say, verily, verily, I say to thee, or truly, truly, I say to you. Amen, amen, I say to you. What that means is, Jesus is saying, whatever I say after this is a solemn oath. Whatever I say after this is, if it's not true, let me be cursed. I stake my life on this. So he's like, it's kind of like a, hey, pay attention kind of a thing. 
Amen, amen, I say to you, number one, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life. Number two, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I will raise him on the last day. Number three, for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Number four, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Number five, just as the living Father sent me and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. In response to them saying, how can he give us his flesh to eat? Are you speaking literally? Jesus doesn't just double down or triple down. He penta he five times doubles down. And we miss it in the English, too, because the original Greek is ramped up language. At first it's like, yeah, those who receive me, then those who dine on me, then those who consume me. And the last time he says, those who gnaw on my flesh will live forever. This is so stark, this is so clear, that the very next point says, then many of his disciples who were listening said, this saying is hard, who can accept it? Question. Is it a hard saying if Jesus, okay, what if I said this? If I said, hey guys, it's been great to be in Notre Dame. I really appreciate, like, I feel really welcome and everything. Just tomorrow, when you're having lunch, if you have your sandwich, when you bite into that sandwich, hey, just, just think of me. <laughs> Is that a hard saying? Is it a weird saying? Yes, but it's not a hard saying. The disciples are saying, no, the disciples are saying, this is a hard saying, who can accept it? And I love this, Jesus says, Jesus knew his disciples were murmuring about this, so he said to them, does this shock you? It's one of my favorite questions, because they're like, yes, Jesus, that does shock me. You just said, and I quote. But then he goes on, he says, what if you were to see the Son of Man, a.k.a. me, ascending to where I was before? Pop quiz, where was Jesus before this? Not like literally before this, he was all walking on the water. Like, ascending to where? Heaven, exactly. I love it. This is like a scene from Aladdin when, uh, like, Aladdin says the genie can't do it, and he's like, oh yeah, did you run my land? Do you wake me up? Do you know who I am? Jesus is basically saying, are you kidding me? You see that big yellow thing in the sky? I did that. See the billions of those that are super far off? I breathed those into existence. You, I thought of you before you were born. Like, I made this entire universe out of nothing. I can, of course, take bread and make it me. This is shock. You know who I am. And here's the thing. If Jesus is God, then everything he says is true. But, as a result of this, verse 66, as a result of this, many of his disciples returned to their former way of life and no longer accompanied him. I don't know if you know this, but this is the only time in the entire Bible where someone leaves Jesus over one of his teachings. People leave him because they're afraid. People leave him because they don't believe in him. This is the only time in the entire gospel where someone leaves Jesus with one of his teachings and the teaching is on the Eucharist. This is where it gets super personal for every one of us. Because I know people all the time who will say things like, well, no, no, I love Jesus. I just don't like the church. No, 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 I love Jesus, but I don't, want, I don't need to worship him at Mass. The reality, and this is a harsh word, and I don't mean it harshly. If I don't want the Eucharist, I don't want Jesus. If I don't want the Eucharist, I don't want Jesus. I'm so sorry to say it like this. But if I don't love him enough to worship him as he asked me to, then I don't love him. I love me, but if I don't love him when it's, I don't have the feels, if I don't love him when I don't have a great sermon, if I don't love him when I'm surrounded by, when I'm not surrounded by beauty anymore, if I don't love him enough to worship him like he asked me to, then I just have to be honest with my heart. I don't really love him. And they all walk away. Picture the scene. There's thousands, literally thousands of people walking away from Jesus. 
Now hundreds of disciples, potentially hundreds of disciples, walking away. And all that's left is that third group of people. Right? Remember? The twelve? The apostles? The original boy band? They, you know, they, they've been camping with Jesus for the last two and a half years. And Jesus looks at them. You'd imagine Jesus look at them saying, okay, guys, 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 don't go anywhere. Don't go. Just, 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 just stay here. Stay here. Stay here. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. What can I do? Uh, kidding. You know. <laughs> Jesus looks at them and doesn't like back it up. He doesn't, he doesn't like redact what he said. He looks at them and he asks them one question. And he says, there's thousands, remember, thousands of people walking away. The rest of campus, the rest of campus is walking away. Maybe over 8,000 people walking away. He looks at you and he says this question, asks this question, do you also want to leave? Now think about the stakes in this moment. I'm sorry, you guys are you tracking still? You still doing okay? Okay, think of the stakes in this moment. If they walk away, guess what happens to the whole mission of salvation? It's over. Yes, Jesus will still go to Jerusalem. He will still offer himself up in sacrifice to the Father. He will still redeem the world, but there will be nobody to bring that salvation to the rest of the world. And Jesus is willing to risk the entire salvation of the world on the teaching on the Eucharist. Do you want to leave too? Again, this is where it gets so personal. It's so personal because Jesus is saying, if you don't accept that, then you really don't accept me. If you don't love that, then you don't really love me. If you don't want that, then you actually don't really want me as I am. And this is one of the moments I just... Sometimes St. Peter gets a bad rap, you guys. Let's just be honest. This is not one of those moments. Although it is a very Peter moment. Because Peter's the one who speaks up, right? And (laughs) you think Peter would look at him and say, well, Lord, it's very obvious. It's called transubstantiation, where the accents remain the same, but the substance changes. It's very obvious. I don't know why they don't see it. No, Peter looks at Jesus and he says, uh, what? (laughs) He says, Master, where are we going to go? We've come to believe that you are, and are convinced that you're the Holy One of God. You have the words of eternal life. Jesus, you are who you say you are, and I do not understand at all how you're going to do this, but we're yours. You guys, I, I, man, I, I never got this. I, 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 I was raised Catholic, and for years I hated going to Mass. Like, it was just like, so in my, my family, the rule was you had to go to Mass no matter what, every single Sunday, every holy day, unless you were too sick to do anything else the rest of the day. You guys, that meant you had to sit in your room. There was no tablets, there was no TVs, there was no anything. It was like, everything was in black and white. Um, <laughs> and I hated going to Mass so much that I as often as I could, pretended to be sick to get out of going to Mass. Knowing that, when my family came home after that one hour of being gone, I had to sit in my room by myself doing nothing. And I was like, that seems like a smart trade. (laughs) I hated Mass so much until one time I was 16 years old, and I came across this teaching. As a 16-year-old, I came across this teaching, and it changed my life. I remember remember sitting up in my room. I don't know why I was reading about this, but God's grace. Um, And I remember going, wait, 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 wait. I remember almost out loud going, wait, it's true? Like, that's really him? And I ran downstairs, and my siblings, my parents, whatever, were in the kitchen. I'm like, you guys, you know like the Mass, like the Eucharist? They're like, yeah. Like, that's really Jesus. They're like, yeah, we know. Like, no, 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 it's like really Jesus. That's actually him. Like, we know. I'm like, no, you don't understand. They're like, we went to Catholic school. Were you sick that day? What was, what's your deal? (laughs) Apparently I was, because I was just like, this is crazy. We are, we are the late family to coming to Mass. I don't know if y'all late family people. We're so late that actually I did a youth ministry retreat last weekend, and one of the youth ministers grew up in the same hometown as me, and she was like, oh yeah, Schmitz is, you're always late. I'm like, I know! <laughs> that Sunday, you guys, that Sunday, I was so mad at every one of my family members. I'm like, you guys, we have to go to Mass. It's really Jesus there. And so I remember uh, we got there eventually, and we always sat in the front right here, and I remember going up for a Holy Communion. It was like, I was just like, oh, I'm just so excited. This is like really, this really him. He's like, ah, oh. you know, I'm just like, <laughs> I remember receive, going up to receive, and he's like, the body of Christ. I'm like, amen, for real this time, you know, kind of a thing. <laughs> I remember like just receiving our Lord in the Eucharist and being like, this is, like, this is him. And receiving him and going like, it's really dry. <laughs> and I remember being so underwhelmed by the reality of God made flesh coming to me to feed me with his self. And it was being so disappointed, like, I don't know what I thought God would taste like. 
Actually, I do. I thought it would be like Pop Rocks or something. <laughs> I thought, honestly, I thought it would be like Pop Rocks and Coke, like combined in my mouth, like, whoosh, whoa, my goodness, like, Lord, it's a miracle. And it wasn't, and, and I go to adoration, we're gonna have in a few moments, like, I would go to adoration and kneel, like, and I'd be kneeling down, like, okay, go. <laughs> I'm ready, whenever you're ready, just go. Come on. And nothing, and I remember at first being kind of really disappointed, and like, gosh, what the heck, Lord? And then just realizing, wait a second, I always thought, in my mind, I always, that's where I usually think, um, I always thought, <laughs> like if I would live 2,000 years ago, and I was walking the streets of Nazareth, and I saw Jesus, like you would see him, and he'd be like levitating six inches off the ground, like, <laughs> like rays of light coming from his hair, just like gently flowing robes. He says your name, like, Michael, you're instantly dead, like this kind of, <laughs> You got like, that he obviously would be God, right? Like the kind of like a sense of like undeniably. But if you were to see Jesus 2,000 years ago walking the streets of Nazareth or Jerusalem or wherever, would he obviously look like God? No. Would he be fully God? Absolutely. But he would just look like some dude. Was he just, he wasn't just fully God, fully man, but God hidden. The glory of God hidden. Almost like God in disguise. Why would he do that? And why does he do that? My guess is this. The whole point of the incarnation was to get close to us. You know, if we, if we saw God for who he really is, man, I would not, I would, I wouldn't approach him. It's like Exodus, where there's that thunder and lightning on the mountain. Like, we can't even touch the base of the mountain or we're dead. I would never walk into a Catholic church if, if God was unveiled. And so what does he do? But he doesn't want you to stay away. He doesn't want me to stay away. He wants us to get close. So what's he do? He hides. He hides and he just waits And that means he's either a punk or he is so in love with you that he's willing to become so small you're, you will ignore him. He is so in love with you that he's willing to hide that glory and let you just forget him. Two more things, so that, that's okay. We come to Mass and we watch. That we're meant to come to Mass and worship. I want to I share with you, uh, if, there's, if there's anything, ah, gosh, I'll, please remember all of it. <laughs> but if there's a couple of things that will transform your experience of the Mass, What happens when we worship God? Like, what happens when we offer up the sacrifice on the altar? Let's back up. Remember uh, in the Old Testament, in the first century when Jesus was on the earth, what happens? You had that precious lamb that you loved, was valuable to you, and you carefully brought it to the altar. You carefully brought it to the wall. You said, this is my sacrifice. This is, this is the one I love that I'm offering. You know what that moment is in the Mass? The moment in the Mass is when the priest is here at the altar and he says, this is my body given up for you, and then he elevates the host. What he's doing, picture this, next time you go to Mass, that's the, that's the chest high wall where you're there with your dad holding the lamb as he's bleeding out presenting the sacrifice, here he is. Takes the chalice, this is the blood, here it is. In that moment, what do we do? A lot of times we, we bow down, and a lot of times we say, Jesus, my Lord, my God, yes, so good. But that's the chest high wall moment. That's the moment that with dad, we're holding that lamb, the precious lamb that we love, presenting him. But the worship isn't offered at that moment. The worship is offered in the Mass, when the priest takes 
the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. And he says, through him, with him, in him. Who's him? Jesus, right. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. That is the moment of fulfillment of the blood being poured out onto the altar. That's the moment when the Father is glorified. That's the moment. It's the whole point. Okay, guys, what's, what are the two points of the Mass? Like, what are the, what's the whole reason we do any of this stuff? I'm so sorry to go on and on. I just, like, but I told you, I warned you, um, you could be somewhere else. Um, <laughs> the two things that happen every single time we go to Mass, the two things that happen every single time we go to Mass, I can guarantee you this. Everyone in this church, you know exactly what those two things are. In fact, I can only, not only guarantee you know what those two things are, I can guarantee you that you could tell me the exact wording I'm looking for, and I can tell you, guarantee you, you can even say the exact purpose of the Mass in unison with the person sitting next to you. I will prove it to you now. <laughs> Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. What happens at every Mass? For the praise and glory of the Father's name, for our good and the good of the whole church. At every single Mass, we are punks, and we show up and we watch the Father be glorified. We show up and we watch as the world is saved. I just, sorry, got to get closer to the camera. I, we show up and we just, we just show up. My father, Mike Schmitz, as the Center presents. So, <laughs> We sit here and we're like, okay, this is where, this is where the Father's glorified. Mm -hmm. or, this, is where the, this is where the world is saved. That's what happens. Every single Mass, the Father's glorified, the world is saved, and we stinking watch it. But what is the thing the priest says right before this? He says, pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours. What is he saying? He's like, I'm a ministerial priest, ordained as ministerial priest. You are baptized. How many people baptized? A couple of you. So. <laughs> When you were baptized, you were anointed prophet, king, or queen, and priest. So the priest says, okay, in a second, the Father will be glorified, and the world will be saved. So pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God the Father Almighty. What he's telling us every, this isn't like some, like, I'm really, you know, progressive priest, and this is like this. No, this is like ancient. The church has been telling us every single time we've been going to Mass, don't waste your priesthood. The church has been begging us every single Mass, stop wasting your priesthood by just watching this. No wonder the Mass is boring. I'm not, I show up and watch when I'm supposed to be playing. I show up and watch when I should be worshiping. That's why the high point of the Mass, yes, such a good gift to receive our Lord in the Eucharist, but I can't go to Mass because I'm in a mortal sin, I can't, like, receive the Eucharist. You can still worship Him, but I'm not in the right state right now, I can't, I can't receive you in Holy Communion, but you can still worship Him. And when you do that, what happens? Two things. The Father is glorified, and the world is saved. That will only happen, that can only happen if we stop watching and start worshiping. So, at the altar, this is just the cues for us. At the altar, this is my body given up for you. Here's the chest high wall presenting the sacrifice with Father, with our dad. Precious blood, this is him presenting him. But then, here's the key. Through him, with him, in him. Who's him? In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father. See, it's all about the Father. All the offering of the Father. Forever and ever. And we all say? Amen. amen. You know, in the, in, the, in the book, it actually, it calls it the great amen. In most Catholic parishes, it's the lame amen. <laughs> oh, I can stand now? Okay. okay. <laughs> this is the moment when kingdom priests, ministerial priest, kingdom priests, kingdom priest, where you get to give your whole heart to that amen, to the whole sacrifice offered to the Father for the salvation of the world, and we just go, amen, I can stand now. Let's pray to our Father. Like, instead of saying, 
the great amen. You know, in the first century uh, church, it said that when the Christians would say the great amen, they would pray that prayer so loudly because they realized their, manis- their, their, their kingdom priesthood, the walls in which they were, would shake. Like, we did a camp once for junior high kids, and, and I was telling them this, and uh, what, this guy was a recent convert. He was in the band, and he was playing electric guitar. So during Mass that day, um, he's off on the side, and I go through him with him, and he's like, Amen! Like, whoa, okay. I mean, <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> you do not have to shout, but... The key isn't volume. The key is the difference between watching and worshiping. Because the key, of course, in the end, the end of it is, is Him. Everything we do is for Him. We love our neighbor for Him. We take care of the outcast for Him. We don't neglect the stranger and the people who are forgotten for Him. And we come here day after day because he's worth it. It's crazy. This is the last thing, promise. He, either again, he's a punk, either he's a chump, or he loves us so much that he's willing to be walked upon. Either our God is a fool or he loves us enough to become so small we'll ignore him. And he's not a fool. He's reckless. Not with you, with himself. He's reckless, not with you, not with your heart, with himself. Uh, when I was in college at the Notre Dame of Minnesota, uh, <laughs> we did this thing where uh, they, you know, we have hosts, right? And they're really dry and whatnot. Um, well, and this, this place, they had, they had actually had unleavened bread, which is kind of neat. Um, but what happened is, like, they gather around the altar, and, and you'd walk up to the person, the Eucharistic minister, and they would, like, rip off a, a, a piece of the precious bo- sacred body in body Christ. And it was neat to have, like, oh, this is, like, substantial unleavened bread. It's kind of neat. But what happened is then, on the floor, all over, to be crumbs of the Eucharist. So I remember it being a college student, and, and I'd be in the back, and there was a guy who, after Mass, he, he would, he, this is a kid in my class, he would go around, and he'd pick up like on his hands and knees, he'd pick up the crumbs and eat the Eucharist off the ground. I remember he was, he was like a, he's kind of like, he's really athletic, really funny, really whatever. Kind of not, not a, I'm trying to say, not a nerd. So, <laughs> someone that I would have thought would be more interested in his, how people perceived him. But after every Sunday Mass, he just walked around on his hands and knees eating crumbs off the floor. And at one point I'm like, dude, what are you doing? Why do you do that? And he said, I'll tell you why I did that. So when he was in high school, he heard the story about uh, when communism came to power in China. What happened was one of the things they needed to do is they needed to shut down religion. And they, one of the things they wanted to shut down was the Christian religion, Catholicism. And so they came into this one town and uh, they ransacked the church, just destroyed everything. They took the priest and they locked him in the rectory house next door. And he was under house arrest, and he just, all he could do was just watch out the window as they just broke all the stained glass and broke everything. And at one point, they took the tabernacle, and they threw it out the window, and it hit the ground in front of him, and it just burst open, and the, and the hosts were on the ground. And all he could do, because he's under house arrest, all he could do was just, was just stand there and pray and adore Jesus on the ground. Again, remember, remember this, here's a God. He's either a chump, he's either a punk, or he's willing to love us enough to be thrown out of a window and lay there on the ground, in the dirt. And that's all he could do, is just pray and adore his God. And as night fell, he just stood there. 
as it got darker, he saw this sh small shadow like dart darting from space to space to space, getting closer and closer. And as it got closer, he recognized the shadow was a 12-year-old uh, girl from his parish. She also had seen this, and so she waited until it was dark, and she got closer, and, and when the guards couldn't see her, she snuck up there, and she knelt down, and she was a kid, and she was told not to touch the Eucharist with her hands, and so she just bent her face to the ground. And with her tongue, she picked up one host. Again, as a kid, she was taught, you only receive communion one time a day, so she just <laughs> received once, made the sign of the cross, got up, and ran into the night, and night after night, the priest would stand there, I just pray that she be safe. As night after night she came by, knelt down and received Jesus. The priest knew how many hosts there were, so he was so relieved that night. The darkness fell. He's like, this is the last night, and then she'll be safe. She got there. She knelt down and she received communion on the tongue. And this time when she got up, she knocked something over, and the guards came running. They saw what she was doing, and immediately they took the butts of the rifles and beat this 12-year-old girl to death after she had received the Eucharist for the last time in her life. And this guy looked at me and he said, do you want to know why I do that? Because of her. Because of him. Because this is our God. It was either a chump we can walk away from because I don't feel anything. I just stopped going to Mass because like, I don't get anything. Or he's a God who loves us so much and he lets us throw him to the ground. Oh, he's a God who loves us so much that he becomes so small we can ignore him. Or he's a God who loves us so recklessly that he's willing to let us ignore him. My prayer is tonight that none of us ever, ever have a heart that's willing to ignore him because he's too small. That none of us ever have a heart that is willing to walk upon him because he's become bread and wine for us. My prayer is none of us ever skip mass because it's like, well, I don't get anything. And my big prayer it's from this, from this night until the evening we step into his presence. We never go to another mass and just watch. We never again waste our priesthood for a single moment. But from this moment until the moment we see the face and the heart of this God who loves us so recklessly that we come here not to watch, but to worship. <laughs>